Hello, Comeback Nation. Barry William Magliditi here, your host of the Comeback Game podcast. Today, I'm lucky enough to interview Mike Michalowicz, author of Profit First, Clockwork Surge, The Pumpkin Patch Plan, and his newest book, Fix This Next. Uh, by his 31st birthday, Mike had founded and sold two companies, one to a private equity, another to a Fortune 500. Today, he's running his own third multi-million dollar venture, Profit First Professionals. Mike is a former small business columnist for the Wall Street Journal and a former business makeover specialist for MSNBC. Over the years, Mike has traveled the globe speaking with thousands of entrepreneurs, and he's here today to share the best of what he's learned over that time. Uh, we dive into some pretty interesting topics. Uh, one interesting one was around Mike's uh, huge setback that was actually the precipice for the launch of many of his books and his very first book, The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur. He shares how many business owners uh, struggle with uh, managing finance and how the profit first methodology is such a beautiful fix for that. But only that we dive deep into his newest books, Fix This Next, that's based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And essentially what it is a very effective, very simple and powerful tool that helps you to diagnose what the biggest problem is in your business right now and what the fix is for that and the ongoing and never ending improvement process to ensure that your business can grow faster than ever before. We're in interesting times right now with the pandemic of COVID-19 and now more than ever has never been a better time to work on you and on your business. So if you're a business owner, an entrepreneur who is maybe struggling right now, uh, you know, having had to shut their business down or having huge financial issues with the current pandemic, or if you're in business right now and things are absolutely killing it, either way, either end of the spectrum, there's a huge amount of data to further understand how to better manage profit, uh, profitability within the business but equally to, to kind of distill and to take away uh, the last 23 years of Mike's experience in growing and scaling companies fast. So that's it for me. Let's have the episode now. And uh, if you are a business owner that's going through some challenges right now, maybe it's that you can't grow fast enough to keep up the demand. Maybe it's just simply that uh, you've had your business taken away from you because you're unable to open your doors. Either way, uh, what I invite you to do is to book a call with either myself or one of my team. Let's have a chat and let's help you put together a free game plan to see you in, out, and through the other side of what we're experiencing right now. Let's head over to this phenomenal interview with Mike Michalowicz and I'll see you on the other side. Hey guys, today I've got Mike Michalowicz from a uh, famous author of Profit First. Uh, his newest book, Fix This Next, Surge, The Pumpkin Patch Plan, and uh, many other amazing talents. Mike, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Barry. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so grateful you could be here. Uh, for those that are watching, listening today, where are you calling in from? Oh, so I'm calling in from uh, New Jersey, right outside New York City. Yeah. And uh, it's the, sadly, it's the hotbed for the U.S. of COVID is all over New York City. So we're in a shutdown. That's why I'm dressed the way I am. I've been uh, working home at home. I can't get my hair cut anymore. It's uh, well, that's the way it is everywhere, I guess. Yeah. And I, I think today's perfect timing uh, with what we're going to talk about a bit later, which is your newest book and the phenomenal opportunity that is for entrepreneurs and business owners right now and uh, how it helps them to specifically diagnose what they should be working on next. But before we kind of jump into that, uh, in case someone watching or listening to this today hasn't come across you, do you want to give a little bit of background about who you are and what it is you do? Yeah, yeah, sure. So that's kind of normal. I wouldn't expect many people to know who I am, but I'm an entrepreneur my entire adult life. And uh, through that journey, I discovered authorship. Uh, I've had the good fortune of building some companies and selling them. I've had the bad fortune, which actually is my best fortune, of starting a company that was a calamity. It was a angel investing firm. And I lost everything. I lost my home. I lost all my money. I lost everything except for my family. But that caused me to reinvestigate what I knew about entrepreneurship and it set me on a path to find the essence of what makes entrepreneurship work and, and to write about it. So I, it's funny because I'm in my home office. I gotta show you. I have, this was where my first book started right here. It was a journal. It used to say the success journal, uh, but I believe that journaling should be about everything. So I crossed it out. And uh, <laughs> this was the start of my first book. I was writing notes to myself and I realized I didn't know much about entrepreneurship. And um, wow. I started to challenge everything, like where profitability comes from and how businesses operate. And, and that's how I became an author. So I'm an author now for 12 years, uh, yeah. helping small business owners. Yeah. Wow. One, one of the, the biggest shifts for me was coming across profit first. Uh, you know, I, I found for myself being an entrepreneur, like I've, I've been in business for more than half my life now uh, for the past 18 years. And I was always able to make money, but I never seemed to have much money. And I remember looking at my P&L reports, it just eluded me how I was making money, yet I never seemed to have any money in the bank accounts. Right. Uh, 
and I, and I, I, I came across uh, Dr. John Martini that taught me about uh, the Richest Men in Babylon book. And it was about kind of tithing and putting small bits in small plates. And I started to do that. But the big shift was finding profit first and how you've done so much research on finding out percentage allocations based on yeah. where your business's revenue or real revenue was that that was a massive game changer for me. Thank you. I, uh, so Richest Man Babylon and Think and Go Retro is these books that teach the concept of pay yourself first and dividing money up. And it's a golden concept in our personal finances. I was struggling, same as you. I, I couldn't make my business profitable. They were growing, but they weren't profitable. So it just hit me. I said, well, what if I just apply these principles to my business? And it felt like it was magic. It, it started working so effectively. So then I set out and I studied, it was over a thousand companies through surveys and so forth of what the, what I call the fiscally elite do, meaning every category um, from, you know, law firms to gyms to pizza shops, everything. What do the best of the best do? And I saw there was a common trend based on different revenue ranges, the smaller businesses to the bigger businesses split up differently, but they all had achieved these profitability standards that the norm didn't. So I set that as a target. So in Profit First, it's called TAPS, or the target allocation percentages, meaning what can we get to if we perform among the fiscally elite? And uh, you know, most of us are not fiscally elite. That's why we're reading the book. So I'd say for the 90 percenter plus, uh, we read this, now that's something to aspire to. It's not a starting point necessarily, but something to grow to. And uh, the beautiful thing is the principles have been around for hundreds of centuries. I mean, well, that's not hundreds of centuries, but around for centuries because, uh, you know, it's, it's taught uh, all the way back to BC of, of setting up plates and dividing money up and tithing. So these concepts aren't new. It's just a, a new application for business. Mm. And, and what I love most is just how simple it is. And, uh, you know, we've had a number of our clients, we, we very much share uh, profit first as one of the first things we take them through, because what we've noticed for a long time is we help our clients to grow and scale uh, exponentially. But in many cases, their accountants or bookkeepers weren't serving them or their business. And yeah. that was seriously impacting our ability to help them to get to that next level. And so with profit first, not only is it super simple, but what I love the most is that, that it provides a sense of clarity. And for many of them, it's quite overwhelming to start with when they see where their business has currently been performing based on those fiscal elite, like you said, and they start to yeah. create the, 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 the taps between the two. But what I also notice is that within three to six months, our clients have reported in that one area alone, they've got more money in the bank and they're more organized financially than they have been essentially their whole life. I love it. I love it. You know, and what was the greatest find, Barry, was uh, that most of the companies that do it, now we have over 350,000 companies globally doing it. We uh, have case studies of thousands of companies. The most surprising result was not that businesses were more profitable. They actually were growing faster than their contemporaries that weren't doing profit first, which makes no sense because everyone says it takes money to make money. So you have to plow back or reinvest your profit. But what we found is when businesses take their profit first, they become much more disciplined in evaluating what works and what doesn't work. What marketing is successful? Let's focus on that and that only. What clients are our best clients? Let's focus on that type and that type only. And by focusing on the best marketing, catering to the best clients, delivering their best products and services, these businesses started to grow faster than their contemporaries. So um, it's interesting, but taking your profit first is also a catalyst for growth, I've concluded. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. And what I found for myself as well is that it almost feels like wealth is attracted to where wealth is better organized. Mm. But if energetically, yeah. you've got a business structure that is that is that is uh, maintaining aspects of wealth. If you're valuing yourself, like what I share with our clients as well is there's there's this element of of splitting the money between the plates. But there's a significant psychological shift that happens within the business owner when they start paying themselves first, and when they can log on their bank account and see they actually have money put aside. They think differently. They perform differently. They act differently in the company. And equally too, like in the midst of COVID nineteen those that have profit first implemented in place are the businesses that are still surviving right now, if not thriving versus those that haven't, it's a huge wake up call to go, well, Hey, I've been running an unprofitable, unsustainable company this whole entire time. That's been band-aided together. Now it's time to get serious. Now it's time to make some new decisions. You know, so, so between every action, there's a reaction, but when we don't have profit, we don't have time for the third uh, necessary component in the middle, which is contemplation. The ideal scenario is action, contemplation, consideration, reaction. You know, what happened? What should we do about it? Let's do it. But mm -hmm. most businesses are, what happened? Let's do it. And they don't have time to think. And mm -hmm. if you don't have that runway of profit, 
become very reactionary. So we, there's a saying that desperate people do desperate things. Mm -hmm. We see businesses here that I've been studying that are just doing ex extreme things like the, the panic and rush to get loans and they're disregarding their business. They're, they're putting a bandaid over a gaping wound uh, and they're not addressing the core problem, which may be cost or something. So profit, the power of profit, of course, is it gives you that time to contemplate, to consider, and really be thoughtful about our direction. The other component, though, is you can't just live on profit. I mean, if, if, if you had some profit and now your business is tanking, you can't just, you know, keep on writing the bills out. At a certain point, that profit will deplete. So it, what happens is you, people that have done profit first, we're telling them, maintain the percentages, keep it just the same, and you'll see the OPEX perhaps depleting, and that's a call to action. That's your business speaking to you, saying, we need to cut costs, we need to increase margin, but maintain the profit system. And now you have runway, but also are going to be actively considering changes to improve your business. Yeah, I love, I love that because it's more of a leading measure and puts pressure on you when pressure is yeah. required because you can't afford to pay the expenses rather than waiting the end of the month, the end of the year and going, oh, we didn't, we didn't make any, any profit and we've got this big tax bill we need to pay as well. Yeah. yeah. And, and sadly, that's what so many people do. The other funny thing about taxes, just real quick, is uh, I can't tell you how many emails I get when uh, people are celebrating taxes. So, uh, the, you know, here, I don't know how it is down under, but here it's once a quarter that you have to uh, pay your taxes, your estimates yeah. for most businesses, not all. And uh, I get emails, Barry, regularly of people saying, you wouldn't believe it. I sent my tax money in. I, I'm celebrating, and it's absurd to say it because we're giving we're giving our money to the government, but yeah. for the first time, businesses now aren't paying the taxes out of the business owner's pocket. They're not writing a check, trying to scramble to get the money. The business has proactively reserved that money, so there's a sense of relief writing these checks, and sometimes they're big checks to the mm -hmm. government. And mm -hmm. uh, that you know, no one enjoys writing a check out to the government. But it does show that we have confidence in the system, that we have confidence in our business, that the business is now caring for us as another thing we don't personally have to worry about. Yeah. And, and in many ways, too, that tax money that we collect is not, never our money in the first place. Yet so many business owners, it's, their business survives because they're using and depleting the tax. Or over here, we also have uh, government service tax as well, GST, depleting yeah, GST. that money. Uh, you know, to, to grow their business per se, but ultimately it's just survival until the tax bill comes and then they're on arrangements. And like I speak to so many people that have got, you know, multiple six figure tax debts that they've never paid because their business has never been structured in such a way that the money's been put aside. And the government does not look uh, well upon that. You know, I, I've, I've had the privilege now of traveling to many of the countries in our globe and I've yet to be, I've yet to visit any country where the government doesn't stick its long hand into the business and, and yank money out. And, and to your point, Barry, we have an obligation. It's part of our citizenship. By running a business, we have a responsibility to collect that money. I, I consider us uh, agents for the government. So when we collect that money, that dollar, a percentage of it is rightfully for the government by law. So as an agent, we collect that dollar, but a portion of that we assign to the government. And in the profit first system, how we do is we set up a account called taxes or government's money, if you want to be really clear about it. And when the money comes in, you allocate that preordained percentage, that amount to that account, and, uh, and then the business cares for it. But to your point, it never really was your money. And since you don't feel it, it doesn't go into your pocket first and then back out, it's become way less painful when you write the check through the business. Yeah, yeah. Ph phenomenal system and one that uh, anyone watching, listening is not currently implementing their business. Absolutely. That's a, a top recommendation from me. Um, curious to know, like you've been in business for how long now? Uh, 20, uh, 25 years. Yeah. So you've probably, probably seen a lot of ups and a lot of downs. And one thing that I, that I find interesting and, and kind of the premise around why we started the comeback game podcast is that, you know, for me, I started to realize that those best days in my life, I never remembered. Like I, I remember knowing that I had those days where it's like, Oh my God, this is the best day ever. Like when I made my first sale or, you know, yeah. my, my, my children are born. But what I remember more is those moments when I was like curled up in a ball, down and out on the floor, crying, like, crying my eyes out, praying to God, because I'd just been like, yeah, smacked and wiped out with something. I've had so many of those moments, you know, bankruptcy nine years ago, mm. uh, was a big one, $1.3 million. But mm. you know, that was the best education I've ever had. And at that point yeah. in time, some part of me knew in my heart, there was a reason behind it. And if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be where I'm right now serving, you know, hundreds of thousands of clients around the world, helping their businesses to grow and succeed. 
I'm curious to know for you, like if you look back over those last 20 odd years, what do you think has been your biggest failure and in that the biggest learning for you as well? Yeah. So uncannily similar to yours, Barry, I, I lost uh, all my money. I, I was in, in my early uh, 30s, was, whoops, was a self-made millionaire. By, I had sold two companies, but then I was just full of arrogance and, and uh, ignorance. I was a dick, to be honest. I thought I knew everything. I was so smart. Yeah. I was so full of myself. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So I started another business. I'm like, I'm so smart. You know, I'll make it rain money and uh, just act like a big dick. And I lost everything. Um, so much so that I got a call from my accountant and he's like, Mike, you, you should declare bankruptcy. I actually didn't because I had the choice not to. Mm. I chose that I had to pay off all my debt, which was significant. It took me years to pay it off. But I lost my house 30 days later. Uh, I lost my cars, possess my hours. I lost everything. I, I go to my daughter and I write about this in my book. She liked to take horseback riding lessons and told her, I, you can't go to horseback riding lessons. As I said that, she ran to her bedroom to grab her piggy bank and she ran mm -hmm. back uh, and she goes, daddy, daddy. She goes, I will start providing for our family. Um, I actually, because we're in my home, I have a picture. You can just get a sense. This is my, I'm a big sports fan. So when this is when they were younger, but that's her right there. And, wow. um, she, she's the one who ran and got that piggy bank. And I was so ashamed and embarrassed uh, about my own behavior. I was so proud of her that I, I, I struggled with that. It, it became the seed for change. But one thing I want to be clear about, it wasn't like the next morning I woke up and said, I got this figured out. You know, I'm going to be an author and, and fix things. <laughs> no, I went through depression. I started to drink a lot, a lot. Um, and uh, it, it took me a few years, but that's when I started that. That's when I started this. I started just writing down thoughts and ideas. Um, you can see it goes all the way back, first century. I don't know if you can see it. July 2008. That's right when I was working on Toy Paper Entrepreneur, my first book. Wow. And um, this, this became the, the inception for it. Um, it's ironic, to your point, the darkest valleys of our life, we can see the highest peaks. And, and that's when we can start the climb. Um, I, I hope I'll continue to climb. I don't know what the next dark value will be. I do know there will be one of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, but I do feel that at least this experience, it, it was so humbling. I felt the ego ripped out of my soul. Uh, I hope I've been de-dicked, not technically, just <laughs> figuratively, but I hope I've been de-dicked yeah. um, and just want to be of service to other entrepreneurs now. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's a beautiful thing is that we don't necessarily get what we want, we get what we are. And yeah. I've seen many business owners that have been humbled or dedicted uh, <laughs> by the universe when, when it's required to help them to, to realize or to understand something or to take a new direction. I think that, you know, COVID-19, uh, as painful as it is, you know, people are losing loved ones and people losing yeah, business. I like I get that. Like I've lost loved ones. I've lost businesses too. Uh, and I also think there's a huge opportunity right now for people to reinvent themselves because yes. Everyone's yes. so worried about themselves. They're not noticing what you're doing. Like now's the perfect time to fail. Now's the perfect time to launch that idea that's so crazy that, that no one ever thought would come to life yes. because everyone else is in the same position. I think this is the ultimate Petri dish for entrepreneurship. To your point, there's such a need shift going on. There's such a macro crisis. I mean, everyone globally, all of a sudden, total spin out. Yeah. And to your point, we can invent now. We can find new ways to care and service for our customers, our, our community, our clients. There, there's so many things that will be inventive. And uh, historically, out of recessions, the best businesses spawn out of recessions, the strongest ones, because they have to maintain and introduce something new. Mm -hmm. On the next side of this recession, and no one knows if it's going to last you know, three more months or three more years or what, but at, after every recession, there's this surge period where the competition that was unable to sustain has been is gone so there's decreased supply but there's also pent up and increased demand there's more customers that have been waiting on the sideline well increased demand decreased supply that's when massive growth happens and that's mm -hmm. why we will yet again i anticipate expect to see some companies that really explode coming out of this and why not be you why not be me you know we have mm -hmm. this opportunity yeah and some we've been saying to a lot of clients, like we had clients that were like basketball coaches or gym studios or, or yoga studios that literally got wiped out overnight by the government. Yeah. And 
you know, yeah. it, it came down to the fact of like, this, this is the new normal until it's not right now. And so there's two options here. One is to hold on to what was a good thing and what was working or two is to reinvent yourself in this moment. And yeah. you know, that they've reinvented themselves and they're back into profitability. They're back into making money in a new market. And when they're allowed to now service their clients face to face again, they've now got an additional product market that's been battle tested in the best time when clients are actually acceptable of it, because it's the only option right now that they can then you know, pair that with their current model that was once working and be a lot better off for it. Yeah. You know, I thought one thing that hasn't been wiped out is, uh, is our customer list, our former prospect list. So yeah, some businesses like here, you know, restaurants there to shut down, you can have no gathering points, right? So you're, you're wiped out, but you still have that list. And can you do the, the, the email or reach out to them and simply ask, we are not, we are still in business, just in a new form. How can we serve you now? What's the new thing we can do? And uh, I'm actually surprised how many small businesses haven't asked, what can we do now? Because the customers know. Yeah. There's a technique also, I call it one step back. And uh, we've been working with restaurants, but it applies in any business. As you look at what you've historically offered, and I call that the final offering. Like you, you put food on a table. That's what a restaurant does. But you simply ask what happens one step back from that. Well, you carry food to the table. Well, carry out or take out could be a new service. And many restaurants have done this. There's actually one restaurant that's collaborated with a food truck. So the food truck is running food into the neighborhoods while they, the restaurant's now a cooking center. So they're actually producing more. But we keep on going one step back. So, you know, you carry food to the table. What happens one step back from that? Well, it's the preparation of food. So, uh, you know, is the cook preparing food? Why not sell the recipes to prepare for the food? You can sell us your customers, your 10 most popular recipes, or you can sell the recipe plus a training video where the chef, she's showing you how she cooks it. Or you could even do training classes, cooking classes, and say we have 10 popular recipes over the next 10 months, I mean, 10 weeks, we'll, we'll do a cooking class every Tuesday night for two hours. And you can charge for that. Then what happens one step back? You can keep on going one step back in your process, what we realize is often for many businesses, that final deliver, deliverable is simply an accumulation of multi small mini deliverables, and they can become your new offering. Yeah, I love that one step back. That's gold, golden. Let's let's use that as a segue into fix yeah. this next. So I, I'm obviously on your email list, uh, follow you, you quite avidly, and you announced this book. Now, we've been working on an assessment tool for quite some time that helped us to kind of diagnose where our clients were at and uh, helped them to apply a fix. And you uh, started advertising Fix This Next. So I jumped on the early subscriber list, uh, got, got a pre-copy, went through certification. And I was like blown away at how simple this process was based on uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yes. Uh, and I, I know the book's not out just yet. It's, it's pretty close. But it was mind-blowing. Can you talk to us about like what was the... Okay, what was the, the seed that, that planted yeah. next? So an accident, um, and it's kind of funny how stuff happens. I sent an email, it takes me about five years to write a book. So I put a lot of research into it. I'm not an efficient writer. I love writing, but it's a very laborious process for me. Mm. And all the concepts I test on myself and test on other companies. So I own a few businesses and we test. So um, it takes a long time to write a book. I have three right now, just as an example, in the works. And, and they're moving along, but they're going to take some more time. Well, I sent out an email about five years ago asking my readership. I said, what do you need next? That, that's the common question I asked to get a sense for challenges. Well, accidentally, I think I double clicked and sent the same email broadcast twice in a row. So same question, maybe 15, 20 minutes apart. And some people answered the same question twice. And they answered the question. The question was, what's your biggest challenge? And some people share, shared their biggest challenge. And it became a different challenge just 10 minutes later. The same person. Wow. And that's when I had the realization, oh, my gosh the biggest challenge business owners have is knowing what their biggest challenge is. Yeah. It became the thesis of the book. We, we, there's a constant rush to the parent issues. There's, there's a boatload of stuff you can do any day you come in. I don't have to worry about that. The challenge is knowing what the impactful is. What's that one thing that's actually going to move the business forward? So that's when I started the research. How do you pinpoint the one thing you need to work on in your business? Wow. Wow. So, so let's tell us a bit more about the business. Like I've obviously seen the, the training behind it, understand the concept, yeah. uh, started sharing with our clients with, with you know, huge amounts of insight and clarity for them to understand, you know, understand Absolutely. the fix. And then we have the tools to be able to apply the fix as well. Can yep. you share more about, I, I guess, how it works, uh, how you came about the, the different levels of the hierarchy of business needs? 
Yeah. So um, I, I'm a big believer in what's called biomimicry. Biomimicry is where we look at something that happens in nature or the human experience and translate it to a business application. And uh, like, like the example uh, is the invention of Velcro. Velcro is invented by biomimicry. A, a guy wanted to make something stick together, pull it apart, stick it together without it getting sticky. And uh, he discovered that when he was walking his dog in the woods, burrs stuck to his dog. Well, under a microscope, he saw that nature figured out this hook system that attaches to fur. You can reattach it. And that's how Velcro was invented. Well, I always look for what's nature doing. And in this case, it was actually the human experience. Maslow identified the hierarchy of needs for us. There's five level of needs uh, according to his principles. And what he argues is that we have some foundational needs that must be satisfied over all the other things. It's the foundation. But only when it's satisfied can we elevate to the next level. And uh, in his hierarchy, the lowest level is called physiological needs. We need air to breathe. We need food, water. And uh, next above that's shelter. And it keeps going up to self-actualization. Mm -hmm. And if any time a base level needs not satisfied, we revert to it. So as we're talking right now, if, if someone came running in and put a plastic bag over my head and duct tapes it, um, and I start suffocating, I will tear that bag. Th this discussion doesn't become as important to me as survival. I'm, I biologically respond to a base level need. Well, I translate this into business. Businesses have a common DNA. And uh, I, there's actually 25 distinct elements I found, but uh, it can be boiled down to the business hierarchy of needs, which is five levels, just like Maslow. The base level need for every business is sales. Sales is the creation of cash, and I equate it to breathing oxygen. No sales, you're suffocating, your business is done. Immediately above that is profit. Profit is the creation of stability. Uh, it gives you runway. We just talked about that. Businesses that have been profitable are sustaining much better because they've been prepared. It gives you time. It gives you stability. The next level above that is order. Order is the creation of efficiency throughout an organization where there's no dependency on the owner themselves. It's one of the ultimate asset tests. Yeah. Above that, the fourth level is called impact. Impact is the creation of transformation. Mm -hmm. This is where businesses are not in the business of transactions alone, they're doing transactions that bring about transformation. It actually shifts and changes people's lives. And the highest level, which I thought was fascinating, was legacy. Legacy is the creation of permanence. And what I found so fascinating about this as I was interviewing business owners that have achieved this is they commonly discovered that they were never business owners in the first place. They've always been business stewards, meaning they had a responsibility to bring life to a business, but it's more about the business than their involvement in it. It's about the success of the business. So even them leaving the business, if it's appropriate for the business's sustainability, is the best move. Mm. That's what legacy is, is that the business can continue on and be of service. Mm. That's, that's fascinating. There's a few things there. First and foremost, um, I meet a lot of business owners that uh, are focusing at the order stage uh, well before they need to be. And yeah, yeah, right. Suffocating the growth because they're trying to implement systems yes. You know, we often say that the, that the only systems you should be putting in place up to the half a million dollar mark is, is the sales and marketing system, right? Because everything else tends to change as the business grows and evolves. The product offering most likely has a few iterations up to that point in time. And I see a lot of people suffocating growth, trying to go for order first and trying to like, you know, oh, I just want a business that's going to produce me 20K a month and I have to do nothing. Right, right? I was in the beach drinking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so they try to try to skip those few steps and wonder why they keep hitting a glass ceiling or why, wonder why they keep reverting back to a lumpy sales process. You know, it's like, it's like building a, a structure. If I want to buy, uh, build a five layer or level building, I have to put the foundation first. Mm. I, I can't build the third, third floor in, in thin air. It'll collapse on itself. Mm. So I've seen businesses actually do two mistakes commonly. That's a great one you pointed out. Another one is many try to uh, open a business and go right into the impact level. Like we're going to change lives. We're ever going to serve people so well and they ignore sales. You know, they're, they're in this mentality, build it and they will come and they don't come. And the business collapses, not for profits are notorious for this, but admittedly many for-profit businesses should be relabeled to not for profits because they follow the same behavior. The other thing I see commonly, which is uh, interesting is businesses that focus on sales only, right? Mm -hmm. So like we need this massive sales foundation. They're in this mentality that sales cures everything, which yeah. it doesn't which it doesn't, and they build this massive foundation of sales, able to support a skyscraper, but they put a little tiny tool shed of profit above it, and it just collapses down within it. They can't even survive one day. Yeah. Sale, these all work in relation. And by the way, is, if I have sales, I don't ignore profit, order, 
uh, we still have elements of that. This is where we concentrate our efforts in the mass improvement of the business. Yeah. So we're at the sales level, that's our core function. We must maintain, but we focus our efforts at sales. Once we're at the order level, for example, once we're genuinely there, you must still have sales, you must still yeah. be profitable, but we concentrate on organizational efficiency. Yeah. And um, so some businesses just, they just try to climb this like as a ladder and get to the top and sit up there. But that's not true. We cycle through this. You will move up, you'll move down, things will change. Uh, the foundation will crack, you'll get back down to sales, you'll climb back up. So we will move around this hierarchy forever, regardless if you're the smallest company, a brand new startup, or you're a mega company like, uh, like GE or Procter & Gamble or Zero out of New Zealand. Like these companies, even with their success, they have to bounce around based upon where the biggest vital need is in the moment. Yeah. And the beautiful thing about the Fix This Next methodology is it lets you know specifically where you're focusing on. So it's a, it, it's, a, it's a process of constant, never-ending improvement. Right, right. So within these five levels, uh, there's five elements. So that brings up 25 needs. So you can go and evaluate this and pinpoint it. Uh, there's an interesting example. I was talking with uh, the university, uh, Old Miss University or University, Mississippi University, which is also called Old Miss. It's a big school in Mississippi. And uh, they were going through this process. They didn't call it the business target of needs, but it was a needs evaluation at the time. And uh, they found that they had a problem with sales. Specifically, students weren't registering for the school, but they were picking other schools in their conference. Uh, so they said, why? And they went through the hierarchy of needs. And uh, what they found is that students pick universities based upon the first five minutes of walking on campus. The first impression really matters. Yeah. Well, they said, okay, so we have a sales problem and it's around impressions. So they focused on this, this element of prospect conversion, conversion. And then what they did is they looked at the other elements. And they found that they actually had an efficiency problem. This is sometimes it happens. You get a couple birds with one stone. The, the campus was being maintained, but the, the crew they had to maintain campus could only keep up with the basic upkeep because it's a massive campus, a thousand acres. So these, uh, they went to their land crew or their land maintenance guys and said, you know, what do we do about this? We want to beautify the campus, add flowers and foliage and all this different stuff. And the crew said, we got to change things. And they changed the efficiency. They found that their mowers, when they were mowing the lawns, when they came upon a tree, they had to move around the branches and jog around it. So the land crew said, why don't we just cut off the branches up 10 feet so we can go right under it? And they had all these different little insights. As a result, they were able to increase efficiency where now maintaining the property only took half the time. Well, the other half the time they availed, two, two and a half, three days, they were able now to do these beautification projects. After just a few years, Ole Miss became known as one of the most beautiful campuses in their conference. And today, they're one of the most, considered one of the most beautiful campuses in all the United States. And you won't be surprised, prospect demand skyrocketed. They got more applicants because of that first impression. So sometimes we find we got to go back to the base in sales and we find a link to another level where we can kill two birds with one stone. Wow. That's, that's, that's fascinating. Uh, yeah. Incredible. Um, something else that comes up before was legacy stage. And uh, it reminds me of an interview I listened to on a podcast, Psychology of Entrepreneurship. And I was speaking about how there was some studies done where they put parents into, I think it was an MRI machine. And while they were under there, they showed them a photo of their children. And they noticed that their brain uh, responded in certain ways. Then they put business owners and entrepreneurs in the machine and they showed them pictures of their businesses. And they noticed that the same brain patterns <laughs> took it off than, than those of parents. And you talked about this legacy, legacy phase. I often see it, and, and I'm a big believer, the same as you, around seeing nature and seeing how that can apply back to business. Mm. Is that one of the biggest challenges people have to get to legacy stage where they can have a business that works without them is their identity gets caught up in things. Yes. Right? Their identity gets so stuck in who they are. And a lot of this is unconscious, but this is why I've seen so many business owners get to a stage where they can exit, but then they create these unconscious sabotages to make them see, I couldn't step out. See, I am required yeah. to be in there because they haven't done the work on the inner game, they've done the work on the outer game. And so I see it very similar to relate to parents with kids. It's like the first day you drop your child off at school or the first day you have a babysitter come over and look after your child, the reactions and stuff that's created, I see is very similar ties to what we have in business, which is where this legacy stage you spoke about before is that I don't think they necessarily start there. I think that's within it, within them, but yeah. they, and, and you, and you, you may agree. Um, but it's going through and, and after they go through and they've hit survivability where, okay, now I've got an income, now my business is working, it's breathing, it's, it's pooping, it's doing all these things without me. 
they can then start to shift their level of identity to where they start to realize, hey, I'm just a caretaker. Like this is not, this is not my child. This is all of our child or this is here for some greater purpose than, than you or I. And they can start to separate themselves and step back. That's such a good observation. I, uh, I actually had a personal experience around it. Coincidentally, in Australia, in Perth, uh, yeah, there's right. a f- famous hotel called Miss Maud in the middle of Perth. And there I was, and I was, I was at the Miss Maud Smorgasbord. They have all this food. And I had left my business uh, for a test to see if I could extract myself out of it because I really needed to get the business operating itself. I wasn't even considering the legacy stage, just the yeah. efficiency stage, the order stage. And uh, I left and I was away. This is my second week. I'm in Perth and I'm checking email, which is a big no-no to be checking in the business. But I did because my identity crisis, I needed it to be important. And no one had emailed me for a week. And I started feeling this, this kind of loss. I'm like, no one needs me. I'm so important. And I felt bad about it. So I reinsert, I subconsciously or consciously reinserted myself in the business. I'm like, I need some reports. What's going on? When I returned from my trip to Australia uh, back home, I asked my colleagues, I said, how, how much do you need me back here? A one is you never need to see me again. A 10, you need me desperately. Like start working now. And I said, Mike, it's basically a one and 1.1. 1. 1. Like, we don't need you. We love you. Uh, but we, we feel empowered. They, they told me, they were very candid. The only time we struggled was when you tried to reinsert yourself. We had this and you started to take it away. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> what I needed to do, Barry, was I needed to get my ego in check. And I found I can channel my ego. I can't squash it. So here's what I did. I used to consider myself the superhero for my business. I could always save it and felt compelled to swoop in and cause problems. Yeah. I changed my title to a shareholder of the business. And what a shareholder is, is someone that gives direction to a business, but doesn't actively involve themselves. I, I own shares in Ford. I don't drive to the Ford factory and try to make a car real quick. I render opinion via votes and I collect money. And a shareholder empowers the board members to move the business forward. That is the title I started to assume for myself. I'm a shareholder in my small businesses. And my responsibility is to give it strategic direction, but to empower the team to run the business. Mm-hmm. And that by, by having that title, I actually services my big ego. I'm a shareholder, um, but it also channels me to be of service to my company and not distracting my colleagues. Yeah, I love that. I love that so much. And I can, I can really relate from my own personal experience and, and that of our clients as well. Uh, yeah, I, I love the shareholder part though. That certainly shifts and, and re-channels that ego as well. Yeah, it does. Mate, uh, we're close to time. We'd love to know before we jump off, what are the three best bits of advice that you've ever been given or you've ever understood for yourself uh, in relation to business? Yeah, um, very clear. My uh, business coach, my first ever business coach, who sadly is ill with coronavirus, but he is recovering, thank God. Uh, He told me once, I I asked him, I said, uh, what do you think about selling this to my customers? I want to do this. And he said, I'll tell you my, my suggestion but never listen to what an expert has to say. And it blew me away because he's an expert. He said, always listen to the customers. So lesson one is the customers know what the customers want best. Lesson two, he told me was don't listen to their words though. Listen to their wallets. I think Mm. it was um, Henry Ford who said, if I simply ask my customers what they wanted, they would sit a faster horse, right? So we have to put something in front of them. And the question is, do they open their wallets to it? Because the ultimate demonstration of their value is not, oh, that's a great idea, I would buy that. It's actually buying it. Um, And the the third piece of advice is simply, it's from Oscar Wilde uh, who said, be yourself, everyone everyone else is already taken. Our businesses are a platform for us. It's a form of ultimate expression. And if we really embrace who we are and make our business an amplification of who we are, then our business can really play out the way we see it. It's very energizing and ultimately catch a life of its own. So just amplify who you are through your business and then the business will start to grow faster than ever before. I love that. Absolutely love that. I love the third one, uh, especially as well. How can, uh, how can the, the viewers and, and listeners today get in touch? So, uh, yeah, so you can, two ways. We have a website to do an evaluation. It's fixthisnext.com. And Barry, we have a custom one now for you as a Fix This Next advisor. I'm not sure if we said it's Barry at Fix This Next or Barry dot Fix This Next dot com. But uh, once we get that domain to you, you can put it in the show notes. But go there. And uh, what's cool at Fix This Next dot com is we have a free eval. So you can actually evaluate your business very quickly through 25 questions, pinpoint what you need to work on, and then bring someone on like yourself, Barry, to evaluate 
Is this really where you are? Match up with empirical data, which is very important, and then start moving forward and resolving that. Yeah. And if you want to learn more about me, it's MikeMcCallowitz.com, but no one can spell that. So you can go to MikeMotorbike.com. That was my nickname in high school, Mike Motorbike, as in the motorcycle. And uh, I bought the domain. So you can go to MikeMotorbike.com, and I have a lot of free resources up there for you. Mike McCallis, my absolute pleasure. So grateful to have you on the show today. Thank uh, you, I look forward to meeting with you again soon. I appreciate you. If you're in a position that many of our clients were before joining us, which is that your business is controlling you rather than you controlling your business, we would love to have a chat to you to see whether or not we might be the right fit to partner with you to help you grow and succeed in business. And over the past eight years, we've helped hundreds of business owners around the world to grow, scale and succeed in business. Uh, many of our clients report we've helped them to triple their profits and double their time off in 12 months or less. If you jump onto YouTube and notice the hundreds of testimonies, you'd see that this is a common theme amongst them. If you're a business owner that's generating more than $300,000 a year in annual revenue, uh, whether it's 500 million, 5 million, even $10 million a year, and you're looking to take your business and your life to the next level, we might be able to help. If you're noticing that your business is lacking structure, maybe systems or processes, maybe you're not quite attracting enough or, or the right type of quality leads, making enough sales, or maybe you've been having issues finding, hiring, retaining, and training the right team members, we could be a fit for you. Ultimately, we believe that we never have business problems, we have personal problems that are expressed through our business. And a lot of the work we do is with you as a business owner, helping you to constantly upgrade the way that you see life, the way that you make decisions, and the way that you help construct a profitable and purpose-driven business. In order for us to do that though, you need to book in a quick 15-minute uh, application call with one of our scaling specialists here at The Game Changers. Through the 15-minute call, we're gonna ask you a bunch of questions to see if or how we might better help you. If we can't help you, we'll let you know politely and do our best to point in the direction of someone that can. However, if we can help you, we'll look at booking you a one-hour game plan session where we're gonna dive a lot deeper into where you and your business are at right now, where it is that you want to go in the next three, five, and 10 years time, and what are the potential roadblocks or challenges or even opportunities that are along the journey in order for you to get there uh, faster. If you're really feeling that it's time for you to, to experience the love and the joy of running a business again, if you're really wanting to experience a business that does actually operate without you while still producing profit, uh, we may very well be the right fit. So book in a 15 minute call, we can have a chat and uh, see where we go from there. My name is Babo Diddy and uh, thanks for listening. Hopefully we'll get a chance to talk soon.